Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nina and folks for um, organizing today's events and for inviting me along. Before I get going on my presentation, I want to just make an acknowledgement to Leo and his team um, for involving community voices, involving community organizations right from the very start for the last um, 12 months, Leo um, at, um, at WHO Europe and um, colleagues at WHO globally have really taken time out and invested in making sure that community um, is involved. You've listened to us. Um, I certainly haven't always um, enjoyed um, late nights um, commenting on more documents, um, but I'm really grateful that at least you've given us the opportunity and chance to do that. So thank you very much um, for showing exemplary uh, leadership um, in community involvement. So um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a whistle, top, uh, whistle stop tour um, on tiny bit of a reminder of where we've been for the last year so uh, just a reminder it was it was um um a, a year ago or under just over a year ago that um in in london um we started to hear about the first patient treated with um mpox and being isolated at a, a london hospital who had recently traveled uh, to nigeria and then um just a couple of weeks later two people diagnosed with mpox who had not um, had a connection um, with uh, with Nigeria or or other similar um, countries on on the African continent, um, and then um, very quickly uh, four new cases on the sixteenth of May, um, bringing total up to uh, to seven people, um, and this was the point when we started to uh, see those alarm bells ringing because these uh, diagnoses were in uh, gay and bi gay and bisexual men linked to particular um, sexual networks. Um, and then by the 22nd of May, just three weeks after those first cases um, were announced, um, we were starting to see MPOX diagnosis, um, as this scientist said, on, on a daily basis. And then on that very same day, um, scientists at the UK HSA were saying, now we have to deal with it. And deal with it we did, not just in London and across the UK, but right across uh, Europe into um, North and South and Central America, and in many other parts of the world, we suddenly had this realization that um, an infectious disease that we had not seen on our shores um, in this large, um, these large numbers was suddenly something that we, um, we had to deal with. Um, there was in the UK a swift response um, from both um, our, uh, our statutory um, bodies, the uh, UK um, HSA, jumped in very quickly um, and worked along with community organisations such as the Terence Higgins Trust to help us to understand what we need to know um, about MPOX. My organisation, the Love Tank on our website um, called queerhealth.info, embedded practical information about MPOX into our MPOX um, information hub that has just recently been um, updated, including case studies of our um, under the radar MPOX events that we've been doing that I'll make mention of um, in just a sec, uh, just a session, uh, just a, sec, a second. Um, and um, kind of harking back to what Leo has just told us about the importance of really involving um, communities in our responses. And we were proud to work with um, our colleagues at UKHSA and the GMI partnership um, to organize a set of ongoing um, live community panel events when we could really help people to understand everything that we knew about MPOX at the time. And because um, it was such a fast, rapid changing um, environment that we were able to keep community um, up to date as much as possible, including up to date information on, um, on, on vaccines as they became available and helping to people to understand how to recognize signs and symptoms of possible um, MPOX infection. But what I want to focus on for the next 10 minutes or so are primarily around issues of ethics and equity, because we don't, we can't, we mustn't throw away as we see new infectious diseases coming into our communities, the ways that we know how to do this work, the ways that we have learned through COVID, through um, decades and decades of dealing with the HIV response, we have collectively developed very clear ethical responses. We've developed evidence-based approaches, and there are things that we know to do and things we know not to do. And I guess I've been alarmed and distressed by how the rule book 
around dealing with ethics and our evidence approaches sometimes get thrown away as we start to panic um, about how we deal and address with new communicable and infectious diseases. One of them being that we know, we know from HIV that telling key groups of people just to stop having sex or to stop having sex indefinitely um, just, just does not work. And I'm again, um, a call out to Leo and his team, really happy that we started to use um, a common language, a collective common language that rather than um, instructing people about what to do um, around with their sex lives, we started to use this narrative of inviting people um, to take a break. Um, so just um, think about um, taking um, a break for maybe um, that one um, hookup tonight or that one party event that you had thought about going to or that one um, orgy that you had thought about going to or maybe if you're involved in sex work, maybe uh, taking a break from that one client this afternoon until you've got your possible symptoms checked out um, with, with a health professional. And for us, it was really important in London to make that caveat because um, unusually for the UK, we had a great big um, summer of sun. And that meant that lots of people were dealing with um, quite normal skin conditions such as skin rashes. And people were worried that their skin rash from the heat may be mpox and that we're then going to go and um, self-isolate for, uh, for a week or so. And so we were inviting people to please take a break from that hookup, that party, that event, until you've spoken to a health professional and you know for sure that you don't have mpox. So the language that was um, much more um, dealing with the reality of how we, how we have sex and how we often um, live our sex lives, particularly for those of us who are part of those key groups of people who were being diagnosed with MPOX. And then um, the second um, ethical approach that um, we started to embed, um, here is an example with our colleagues from MPACT based, at, based in Oakland in California, was to try and um, embed an ethical approach about community norms. And that was a narrative that we were trying to invite people to think about. Um, if you have, um, if you've just experienced someone who may have MPOX symptoms um, or has MPOX, think about the way you treat them um, and try and understand that you could hopefully treat those people in the way that you would be treated if you had just looked at your genitals and found out that you had um, spots or symptoms, or if you had just been diagnosed um, um, with MPOX. And what we were trying to get people to understand is that if you, if someone tells you that you have potentially been exposed to MPOX through them, then how you respond to them in that moment will determine how they go on to respond to other people in the future. So um, if you are mean, if you gossip, if you um, if you're blaming, um, if you um, are, um, are mean about um, there is that them disclosing this to you, then they are much less likely to go and tell other people after that experience. But if you are affirming and positive and, and gracious that they have taken time and taken a risk to uh, share this information with you, then they are much more likely uh, to tell other people um, um, in the future. So in addition, there was a narrative that also played out related to what I've just said, that we should be starting to um, move to a place where we close down sex on premises venues. This is a quote um, from a very um, uh, uh, um, problematic organization um, based in the UK that put out on their social media that then recalled after much criticism that we should be um, using MPOX um, to close down um, dark rooms um, and saunas. And again, we know from our experience with HIV, our evidence-based um, public health and health promotion approaches that closing down, taking choices away from people doesn't help our public health response. Instead, what it does is it pushes people underground and makes it much harder for us to engage with some of those people who we might want to engage with. And instead, um, a much more evidence-based approach is actually to think about how we can use um, the owners, the managers, and the people who attend uh, saunas, sex on premises venues, um, and and fetish events, as as, as <clears throat> excuse me, as educational allies in our responses, and so we started to um, help um, our 
um, our colleagues who um, who run and own these venues in London to think about how they can make their sex spaces as um, MPOX free as possible and, and trying to encourage those um, venues to make sure that they were supportive of their staff. For example, if the staff um, found out that they might have had MPOX, a, a much more thought through um, approach with very targeted educational information um, to support those people who are using sex on premises venues. And then another ethical approach that I think that we haven't always done so well on, and, and again, thankfully with the, with the input of community organizations, we've been able to put some of this right. Um, some of the early guidance or some of the early draft guidance, um, both regionally, um, nationally and internationally used some narratives um, that included invitations for us um, not to have sex with people who might have um, rashes or spots or possible um, symptoms of MPOX as someone um, who grew up and still has a number of um, skin conditions. I was really um, upset and traumatized by some of the public health narratives that might suggest that people um, wouldn't want to come near me during last summer because I have a history of, of acne and eczema. And I think there were really unnuanced, un, unnuanced approaches that in our attempts to reduce MPOX and our rush to reduce MPOX had quite unintended and unhelpful and very stigmatizing um, impacts for those of us who have current health conditions. The slide here that I have shown um, shows some of this very well publicized narrative. Um, I believe it was from Spain when um, someone who thought they were quite well-meaning tried to chastise um, a, a, a guy on, on the metro um, and said, look, here's someone, here's someone irresponsible with MPOX who is going out and potentially passing MPOX on to the general population. And it turned out, uh, like me, that this was someone who lives with um, an, an ongoing um, dermatological condition, um, not helpful and doesn't help um, uh, us in our responses. Um, as I move on, I want us to be reminded how MPOX has shone a light on existing health inequalities. Um, again, those of us who work in HIV and sexual health um, will know um, that those health inequalities persist. They persist around um, access to HIV testing. They certainly persist um, in access to new prevention technologies such as PrEP and what MPOX has done. So that it's just again shone a light, illuminated where these inequalities um, exist and, and how they are perpetuated. Um, if you followed the news in London last summer, we had some of the most fantastic um, Supervax events. Here's a, a, a long distance photograph from the one that was held at London Bridge a couple of, a cup, a, across a couple of consecutive weekends that brilliantly um, vaccinated tens of thousands of people and you could stand in line um, in, in the heat for um, five or six or seven hours and wait, you, wait your turn um, for um, vaccination. But um, what, we know, what we ended up knowing was that these vaccination events were um, primarily attack, uh, attracting white cisgendered gay men of a certain um, demographic group and were not attracting um, many of those groups of people who may have been um, um, more or most likely to be exposed um, to MPOX. The next slide, I'm not expecting you uh, to read the data, but this um, um, confirmed cases data slide from UKHSA of just shy of a thousand people um, showed that in August 2020, uh, uh, 2022, around half of those people who were diagnosed um, with MPOX had not been born in the UK, um, meaning that therefore, um, these big super vax events and vaccination only being available through um, bricks and mortar um, sexual health clinics were probably not attending to many of the people who needed to be vaccinated um, against MPOX. And so this is where I'm really proud of our community response, how our community groups have stepped forward along with NHS clinical colleagues to really try and address some of these health inequalities. Um, we worked with colleagues in um, both Barts and Homerton and NHS Trust to provide um, MPOX vaccination at, uh, at UK Black Pride. Uh, last summer, 260 people stood in line um, when they would probably have rather been um, drinking beer and dancing. Um, and again, for me, this shows our community resilience, our community resistance. This is not an illustration of a community being complacent. This is an illustration of communities stepping forward and wanting to be empowered and take control 
of our health and to protect both themselves and the people that they are close to. Um, we've continued this um, throughout uh, the last year and are continuing it now to do what we're calling MPOX UTR or under the radar events. And those are often events that are not advertised in advance, um, even though I'm showing you an example of an advert, something that was um, in, um, advertised in advance. And the idea being that you may just encounter the opportunity to receive um, an MPOX vaccine um, at an event that you are already at. And we are absolutely and most definitely um, being able to overserve and target um, queer people of color, trans and non-binary people, um, homeless LGBT communities, um, people who are involved in sex work, and absolutely those people who are not the demographic group who are stepping up um, to uh, to the Supervax events. And then, and then finally, um, and as as Leo and colleagues have have already pointed out, um, it's it's summer festival season, and it's also summer and spring fetish festival season. And so um, we've developed a, a, a second um, prong of work called Ready For It. And we're, uh, we're targeting um, gay and bisexual men who may be um, either doing, taking a summer break to somewhere like uh, Gran Canaria um, or going and attending um, one of the big fetish events that are happening um, in, other, in other parts um, of Europe and in, and in places like London and Manchester. And our new approach or our, our, our the, the approach that we're finding is working best is not to push this as an MPOX intervention, but instead to embed um, other health and well-being, including other vaccinations. You can see here Hep A, B, um, HPV um, vaccination, but also reminding people um, as they think about preparing and getting ready for um, either spring or summer breaks or one of these fetish festival events to also make sure that um, they've got enough prep ordered or if they're not on prep they're thinking about whether prep might be for them and or if they're living with HIV to make sure that they've got um, enough meds before they travel so a much more kind of holistic way of um, encouraging mpox vaccination and then as as I as I come to the climax and and I finish I want to um, remind us of our calls um, of keeping an ethical approach right at the forefront of how we do this work, of remaining um, evidence-based in the approaches um, that we use. Um, we've got lots of things to learn. And for me, my call out um, to the UK right now is of all of the things that we need to be learning is now is absolutely not, absolutely not the time to be rolling down our MPOX vaccination programs. If you are one of those people, one of those decision makers who is part of the decision making to stop England's MPOX vaccination program in June and July, it is the worst, the most absolutely stupid, unevidence based decision to be making. Please don't be that person who makes that decision. Um, it will lead to us being back in the situation that we were in. Um, last summer, please let's make sure this vaccination program continues. Thank you.